My name is Teresa. I'm an alcoholic. Grateful to be here. Grateful to be sober because of a loving God. <sighs> Thank you for doing a 12-step call on me. I get to stay sober another day. I uh, didn't realize it. I, I scheduled to speak twice today, so I hope I'm not too sick of myself when I get done. I spoke early, like literally about an hour ago, so let's see what happens tonight. <laughs> I'm like, y'all missed it. It was really good. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> oh, goodness gracious, great balls of fire. Ah, oh, That's always pressure when somebody introduces you, you know what I mean? I have yet to hear anybody go, you're going to hear a horrible person that I can't stand, but I'm willing to let them come and share. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's a lot of pressure. Thank you, Candace. Oh, goodness gracious. Um, I always have a share before I share. It helps me out a little bit, so just bear with me. This helps to get it out of the way. Um, and that is that I'm uncomfortable. This is awkward. I feel extremely vulnerable. And it's intimidating. Um, but I do it anyway. I do it because my life depends on it. This is a life and death errand. And somebody did it for me. So here we go. I want to welcome our new friends. I see we also have a recovery home. Hey, how y'all doing over there? Hope you'll be all right. Stay with us. It's all good. Hello. <laughs> So there's a lot of newcomers up in there. Just hang in there. You're going to be all right. Uh, <laughs> I want to welcome our new friends. Welcome home. We've been praying for you. Please keep coming back. And don't leave five minutes before the miracle happens. Let us love you so you can learn to love yourself. And that won't make any sense. So you just keep coming back until it does make sense. And any old timers in the house. Thank you for my life and my sobriety. I still want what you have. And we need you. Thank you so much for letting me know that I too can recover one day at a time. For doing a whole lot of no matter what. If anybody, uh, any new folks, grab you some old timers. They're usually the most quiet person in the room. And if they're not, they call them the bleeding deacon, but they get to keep coming back. And sometimes that changes. <laughs> uh, they give you these little simple one nugget messages. I remember I had asked, we had our old timer. He's passed on now. He had like 50 something years. And he would go up to Herb and say, hey, Herb, how'd you do it? And he'd be like, one day at a time. He'd be like, that was deep. Thank you, Herb. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And I'm just so grateful for the old timers. I'm telling you, I don't know where I would be if they weren't here when I got here. So, and I don't know if this happens in any of your home group, but there's something that attracts me to this. I don't know why, but I totally dig it. But in our home group, there are a lot of old timers that have been hanging out with each other for the last 30, 40, 50 years. And some of them still don't like one another. And I don't know why I like that. There's something about that I totally dig. <laughs> <laughs> they always said, if you love everything, you haven't been to enough meetings. <laughs> We're a group that don't normally mix, right? But they just keep coming back. And it's funny because one will get up to share and this whole group will like roll their eyes. You're like, oh God, he's still here kind of thing. <laughs> but I just totally love that. Um, as an old timer, Betty T, most people didn't like her. And she would be like, this ain't no popularity contest. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> I totally identify with that. So if you knew, we're not here to just, you know, love one another. Uh, it's not a social club. I came here like, I visualize it like the emergency room. When I go into the emergency room, I can't say I care for everybody in there, but I just need to see the doctor. You know what I'm saying? So I stay. Um, oh, goodness gracious. So I have a short period of time to share with you uh, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. There's a reason for that if you're new. And if you're attending a lot of meetings, we tend to hear a lot of those stories, right? People sharing. And in our literature, in the doctor's opinion, he talks about a message of depth and weight. It is the language of the heart. I believe it's the music that we find in these rooms that nobody else has been able to capture my attention. And this is the one thing that I get to do, right? Is I get to share my experience, strength, and hope and let it fall where it falls and does what it does. Um, but that's the magic that happened for me was that as I began listening to you, it just did something to me. 
for the first time, nobody was telling me what to do or who I was, what was wrong with me. It was through their stories and listening to them that I was able to answer the three questions that our big book and the preface invites us to answer. And that is that happened to me. I felt that way too. And perhaps this program can work for me. And so I give you a reader's digest. Uh, my sobriety date, which is the most important date, and I hope it never changes, and that is March 29, 1990. So, but for the grace of God, fellowship, sponsorship, sponsees, it takes a village, you know what I mean, <laughs> to raise somebody, the big book, the steps, the 12 and 12 prayer meditation. I've had the honor and the privilege of being with you all for the last 31 years. That is crazy crazy. I'm still tripping on that. That is insane. I've grown up here. Uh, I'm 55. I'll be 56 next month. Mm -hmm. I came to you at the age of 24 going on 25. And so this has become the norm. And we talk about living two lifestyles in one lifetime. And I certainly have, if not more so. Uh, so, oh, goodness gracious. Okay. Oh, blah, blah, blah. I tell you, I always say God has a sense of humor. For some reason, I believe he, I really feel like God's like, if I don't put you in front of these people telling the story often, we might lose you. <laughs> I'm like, okay, but I never forget it. I don't ever want to repeat it. Even though I feel so far removed from her, and whenever I talk about what it was like, I feel like I'm talking about myself in third person, right? Like I'm talking about a stranger. I know that it'd be really easy to go back to it like I had never left it. Um, so I don't ever want to forget her. Um, so my relationship begins in the womb. I'm born addicted. My mother's an alcoholic. She's in recovery. She has 34 years. And so I was getting loaded in my mama's belly. So. I don't have the luxury of telling you stories about how I met alcohol later on in life. You know, I like hearing all the stories in the room, you know, like you went to the prom and you felt uncomfortable and you had a drink and it went down and it felt good. And all of a sudden you could dance and have courage and all that. I don't have that experience. I was getting loaded in my mother's belly. And uh, my mother tells you I'm a product of rape. My dad says something different. My mother left me in the hospital. She didn't want me. Uh, my dad and my grandma brought me home. I would cry. And the only thing that my body would accept was alcohol. So that's what they gave me. Uh, that was the only thing. I would spit up milk, formula, and juice. Like I would just spit it up. Like I, my body just did not ingest those other liquids. And they found that the only thing I would accept was alcohol. So that's just what they gave me. We're Puerto Rican, so they gave me rum. 151. <laughs> uh -uh, mommy's over here, right? <laughs> For some reason, she has yet to be shameful about that story, but whatever. My mother be like, yeah, that's right. We gave me 151. So <laughs> that's the laughter you hear in the background. Um, and so <laughs> that's what they gave me. Now, they wanted to wean me off, but they left me alone in the house with mommy. Mommy started to smother me and finally kill me to be successful in getting rid of me. But for whatever reason, she remembers saying, if you give her alcohol, she'll stop crying. So that's really where my relationship began with alcohol because mommy set a precedent. She made the announcement that a bottle of alcohol was to remain in my mouth 24 seven. And the only time that bottle to be taken out was to be refilled and then put back in. Now I really believe, and I think she's mentioned it now she has Alzheimer's, but, um, that her intention was hopefully I would die from alcohol poisoning or crib death or something. Uh, and if I didn't, then I would never be seen or heard. And certainly you would be talking to a ghost if I died, uh, but I didn't. So I was never seen or heard. And what that tells me is that I am truly an alcoholic. Because only an alcoholic as an infant can survive only being given alcohol and I not die. Instead of my body rejecting it, it accepted it, absorbed it, 
and demanded for more. Now, needless to say, I was always malnourished. I was sick. To this day, I have immune deficiency. Whenever they, uh, they run my T cells, they think I have HIV or AIDS because my T cell count is always very low. Uh, and so I was always in and out of hospitals. They would, the only time I received nutrition was in a clear bag, you know, the, that clear whatever nutrition they give you in the hospital. That was the only time I got nutrition. And they would send me back to the home. Now, I don't know why they never removed me, but they would always just send me back. My dad and my grandmother fought for a long time, uh, but they lost the battle with alcoholism. My dad left when I was two. My grandmother stuck around a little bit longer and eventually she left as well. And I have an older brother and my brother never understood the relationship between my mother, myself and alcohol. He tried to intervene many times. Uh, He didn't win either. And it was very difficult for him. He just never got it. He didn't understand it. There was a dynamic between mommy and I and alcohol. It was like crazy. And so I sum up the first 24 years of my life and my relationship with alcohol with adjectives that were given to me when I came here. And that is, you say, I come from a dysfunctional family. This is my family to this day. Pimps, dealers, hustlers, gangsters, mafia, but they're also police officers, politicians, and priests. So I didn't see anything different between any of them. They're all alcoholics and addicts. Um, There's four members who aren't. That's my grandmother, my father, my cousin Petra, and my brother. Nobody likes them. Nobody wanted to be like them. Nobody was happy when they came into the room. So as as it's opposite, some families, right, uh, the alcoholic is the black sheep. They were the black sheep. We did a lot of salsa. We love rice and beans. We live together and we're very tribal people. So we tend to live with one another or live in the same complex or neighborhood. And so there was always a lot of drama, excitement, partying, Uh, even in the insanity and the dysfunction, there was always a lot of joy and laughter and music. And so I wouldn't have associated dysfunction or something wrong with it. I mean, I had uncles that were heroin addicts and they would nod out at the table And I would tell, you know, pretty much I was so used to it that I'd be like, oh, yeah, he'll finish his conversation when he comes back. Like, I don't know if you're not any heroin addicts, but they nod out and they come right back where they left off in the conversation. They have like a commercial break. You know what I'm saying? And so I didn't see that as embarrassing. You know what I mean? I'm like, he'll finish in a minute. He'll finish his point when he comes back. Right. So (laughs) that was like normal. Most people in our family died from cirrhosis of the liver, kidney failure falling down, cracking your skull, getting shot or ODing. And when you die in my family, we put your drink or your drug of choice in the coffin with you and we take pictures. We celebrate your death and we cry when a baby is born. I remember when my aunt died, she always had a Budweiser, always had a Budweiser in her hand. And when she died, I got to Puerto Rico. I looked in the coffin and she didn't have a Budweiser. And I went and got her Budweiser and I put in the coffin. And I'm telling you, she smiled. Before that, she was not smiling in that coffin. I don't know if I was delusional, but I am telling you, her face completely changed. And so to me, this was normal, but you call that dysfunctional. The other thing I learned when I came here, uh, I grew up with physical abuse, verbal abuse, and sexual abuse. That was the norm. Everybody did it. I was sexually abused by men and women. It wasn't selective, it wasn't just men. Babysitters, neighbors, cousins, aunts, uncles, whoever. Whoever wanted to do whatever they wanted to do to me. You wanna let out your sexual aggression, then I was open season. You wanna let out your frustration, then I get kicked, punched, smacked. I've been pistol whipped, I've been shot in the butt. My brother said he was aiming at the chair, but I was sitting on it. Uh, Poked with knives, cigarettes. You know, I was called all kind of names. I didn't know that something was wrong with that, that that was inappropriate. I, I, because it happened so often and by so many, I just thought that was the way things were. I think a a large part that allowed me to survive that and to ignore it actually, and to not even feel the abuse was alcohol. Because I don't know if it spoke to you, but it spoke to me. It told me if nobody loves you, I love you. 
and it took good care of me. It allowed me to be detached and disconnected. Like I had no heartbeat. I was emotionally disconnected from all of it. I would have, I don't know if you ever seen that movie, Death Becomes Her, but it was like, I would have broken bones and still smiling, talking about, are you gonna put that back? I really, alcohol was my friend, my companion, my therapist, my nurse, my lover, my oxygen, it was my master. I never went a day without it. I didn't have to go look for it in the street because it was administered and it was given to me. The well never went dry. So I don't ever remember seeking it, uh, negotiating to get it. I think the closest I came to negotiating to have a drink was mommy used to threaten me if I didn't have an A, if I didn't come home with A's in my report card, then I couldn't drink. I went to Catholic school for 11 and a half years. I said the Our Father and the Hail Mary. I sang in the choir, man. I took my communion. I, this is a way of life for me. All my friends of 15, 20 years, my senior, I was emancipated at the age of 14. I had a fight with mommy. Mommy and I used to fight often. I went into juvie. I came out of juvie and the judge said that my IQ was ridiculous. I could do the judge's job at that moment if I wanted to. Uh, I was not a juvenile delinquent. I did not have issues with authority figures, but they found that if they left me five minutes alone with mommy, something would happen to me. My character would completely change. And they felt that I was not safe enough to be returned to the home, but I was also too mature to be placed in another home. So I was given my independence. I was emancipated. And I, at that time, I had my own business in Harlem, New York. My man was 26. He beat me on a daily basis. And you couldn't tell me that wasn't love. That was my man. And, his, and he, you know, later on in sobriety, I found that he kidnapped me. That was my kidnapper. Um, but I thought that was my boyfriend. He kept me locked up in the tower. I can only come out to go to work or school. And then I got locked up again. And he would do whatever he wanted. But as long as he supplied me with alcohol, it didn't matter. Ultimately, I would tell him, are you finished beating me? You've been beating me for the last 45 minutes. I want to finish watching the rest of it. Can I watch the end of that movie? What do you think? You're not tired? That's how detached I was from all of that. And I lived like that for 24 years. I never planned on changing that life. I wasn't planning on escaping from it. I didn't do New Year's resolution. I didn't say tomorrow's going to be different. This is the way it is. As I got older, I began to live like Michelle Pfeiffer on Scarface. I was into money, property, and prestige. I dressed up my outsides. I didn't know I was dying on the inside. I didn't know I was suffering from what you call a spiritual malady. I didn't know I had what you call an allergy of the body. My body was like, feed me, see more. And I used to sip my drinks. I didn't chug a lug, dance butt naked on tables, Mommy was a mess. Mommy was the drunk. I sipped my drinks. I drank Cavassier and I drank wine. I remember when I came to the program, I told my sponsor, I don't think I'm an alcoholic. I don't know about one's too many and a thousand's not enough. I didn't hide my bottles. I was looking at the differences. You know what I mean? I didn't, I didn't drink like that. And she took me to downtown Skid Row to introduce me to myself. Thank God for good sponsorship. If you have been drinking as long as I have, I've been drinking since fetus. I don't need a lot. I only need a sip. I just had to have it all the time next to me. I smoke cigarettes that way. What I need to do is take two puffs, put it out, and I'm good. Take another two puffs, put it out, and I'm good. That's how I drank. And as I said, I wasn't planning on changing that life. Straight up. Not once that I say I'm not going to live like this again. It was only till I don't know, for whatever reason... And here is where I believe most of us meet, because I hear a lot of stories in these rooms. But something happened that was a game changer. And that was, for whatever reason, I became present for my experience. That's a game changer. I don't mind doing incomprehensible, demoralizing things when I don't notice. I have a problem 
that all of a sudden I walk into a bar and I hear them say, look what the trash bought in. How long they've been saying that? I can't tell you how long they said it. They could have been saying that for years. I remember when I heard it. And I tried to laugh that off, but I couldn't shake it off. See, that's different. I saw the look of disgust on my grandmother's face. I couldn't shake it off. And I noticed that daddy stopped talking to me. When did daddy stop talking to me? And more importantly, why do I care? I hear around here about burning bridges. I ain't burn no bridges. You know why? I ain't never established any. I don't need nobody. I don't have to have nobody. It was just me and alcohol against the world. And now all of a sudden I wanted to know where everybody was at. <laughs> The way I describe it is that alcohol betrayed me, abandoned me, and left me emotionally retarded with no coping skills. And now I'm present in this thing you call life, and I had never been here. Never. It was like a haunted house. As though I was resuscitated, I had been living in a coma for 24 years. And they resuscitated me, and now I'm here, and, and I had never been here. It scared the living daylights out of me. I like the effect produced by alcohol. And when I'm restless, irritable, and discontent, I like the ease and comfort that it gives me. But I have a problem when I'm restless, irritable, and discontent, and I take a sip, and I'm still restless, irritable, and discontent. I don't know about you, but that's a problem. That's scary. I heard incomprehensible is a whole, incomprehensible demoralization is a whole lot of things. But when you can't get drunk and you can't get sober, it's the worst place for an alcoholic like me to be. I started trying every combination that I can possibly come up with so I can get flatlined again. And no matter what I did, I was still present for my experience. That was horrible. I started feeling every punch, every bruise, every broken bone, I started hearing every sound. It's like alcohol used to be like the three monkeys or four monkeys, I don't know whatever those monkeys are. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, whatever those monkeys, right? Now, all of a sudden I could hear everything, I could see everything, I could feel everything. That was horrible. That was I, Every time I think about it, I start having heart palpitations. And if you're new, I hope that every time you think about your last run, you get so sick to your stomach, you just wanna throw up. Because I can tell you about good times. I hung, I'm from New York, man. We had good times in the 80s. I hung out in Studio 54 and all that stuff, right? I had a good time. But those were dark days where I couldn't dress up my outsides anymore. I started living like Dorian Gray. You ever seen that movie, Dorian Gray? Where I started looking like the portrait. I like how Ralph, my grand sponsor, says I used to be employee by day and vampire by night. And then one day the vampire showed up to work. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't know what was happening. I couldn't put on enough makeup. I couldn't take a bath because the water hurt my skin. The sun burned. Everything was noisy. My alcoholism is centered in my thinking where I only have two thoughts, how to or how not to. And those thoughts just haunted me and haunted me. And because I couldn't get flatlined again, the best thing I can come up with was to die like i invited death in my life and i think it's horrible when you invite death in your life and death don't take you out like <laughs> what's up with that let me look man that still trips me out <coughs> that's not fun anymore and because i couldn't even die right i ended up doing an aimless walk that's what I call it. No purpose, no agenda. It's just a walk. And I ended up in a church. Wasn't looking for the church. And I felt the presence. And I said a prayer. Perhaps it's different than any other prayer. In that moment, there I stood. Isolation, desperation, bewilderment. In that moment. I can't tell you that I was done or I was surrendered. I just know that there I stood in that moment. And that's where the window 
of the grace of God became visible. I could have missed it. And I say, God, please allow me to feel the peace that I feel in this church inside of me. I distinctly knew that whatever that energy was, was outside of me. My insides was so restless. I just wanted a moment for my head to shut up. My skin to stop crawling and for my stomach to stop turning. Yo, it was like, I was like, I feel like I lost my hustle, man. It was like, what was that? That was horrible. That was just, ugh. Just wanted a reprieve, just a moment. Just stop, just stop for a minute. I had no idea that prayer was going to change my life, folks. I didn't even know what I was praying to. I didn't know if anything was listening to me. They call that the cry of desperation. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous because you have a tradition. It's called attraction rather than promotion. My mother's sober, my cousin. And maybe you messed up my drinking. Because they say once the seed's been planted, you can't drink the same again. And they have been here for four years. And I remember you people. Your smiles, your laughter, the warmth and the camaraderie you have with one another. I remember you never shunned me, roll your eyes at me, suck your teeth at me, or try to shove a pamphlet down my throat. And I'm grateful. I'm telling you I would have figured out how to die out there if anybody would have did that to me. I'm glad nobody did that to me. I just remember you guys used to laugh. I don't know, it was like a dream. I detoxed on a Greyhound bus. I arrived in downtown Los Angeles on March 29, 1990, wearing a size one pair of pants, two pants underneath, a huge sweatshirt, four months pregnant, didn't have a heartbeat. By the time I got here, that was my fourth child I had lost. All my babies, I, lo I lose them, all of them. My womb's so polluted, I can't keep a child. My mother picked me up and she dropped me off directly in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. She left me there because you told her to. She can't help me. She turned me over to the people who saved her life. So I was 3,000 miles from New York City in California with a room full of strangers. <laughs> Talk about a group that don't normally mix. And I'm a New Yorker, folks. I'm a Boricua. I'm a Puerto Rican girl from New York. Now, I know people call New York a melting pot, but we're very segregated, okay? Okay. I ain't never hung out with anybody other than Puerto Rican. That's just my thing. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> I walked into a room and I was like, oh, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Where the Puerto Ricans at? Because I never, look, I take the train with people who are not Puerto Rican. I'll go have pizza in Little Italy. I'll go to Chinatown, but I ain't hanging out anyway, okay? If you don't eat rice and beans and listen to salsa, I don't know what you and I got to talk about, okay? And watch Telemundo. And so I came in here scared and confused because the life I had been living was the rug was pulled up under me. I was present in this thing you call life. And coming to AA was like Disneyland. I came to, uh, abducted by aliens. And I got sober in South Central. And South Central scared me because they randomly shoot people they don't know. Now, I come from mafia. Okay, so whatever. I, I think it's funny, but it's not funny. But they do. They just randomly shoot people. I was like, damn, y'all deep. I thought... <laughs> Oh, it was candlelit. You just shoot strangers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I was like, damn, <laughs> that's deep, yo. That's, that's some serious stuff right there. I'm just saying. <laughs> you don't even know them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie. Those people scared me. <laughs> I was scared. <laughs> I was scared. Wait a second. <laughs> I was like, I'm not gonna mess with these people. I'm gonna do whatever they say. <laughs> so... <laughs> Mommy's cracking up, but I was serious. <laughs> and when I came into the rooms, look, my partner tells me not to say this, but please, I'm only telling you the way I was thinking when I got here. I've learned different sins, okay? And some reason it applied, it, it kind of helped to my benefit. I came here, self will run riot, uh, arrogant, thought my stuff didn't stink. I had it going on. You know what I mean? I'm from Manhattan, right? I'm from Manhattan. <laughs> we have it going on, right? And I really believe when I came to you that the people in AA were retarded. Now, I, my girlfriend says that's not a good word, but I really thought everybody was retarded because they kept saying the same thing over and over again. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I just remember going, 
yo, that man is retarded. You know what I'm saying? But this was the thing. Instead of me going, there's a lot of retarded people in here. I don't belong here. My arrogance and my ego help. Like, I think God used it to my benefit. Because instead of me going out and belong here, I was like, yo, that retarded man got 33 years. Like, where's the big book? You know what I mean? Like, I got this. Because if that retarded man could stay sober 33 years, ain't no way I'm, getting, I'm not going to get this program. <laughs> I'm that serious. <laughs> they seem very retarded, okay? <coughs> but I didn't know that they were just simple. <laughs> you had a lot of characters in that room. And they were like, they were some assholes. They were, and it just seemed that it was an eclectic, dysfunctional, strange group of people, right? And I'm used to dysfunction, but it was something interesting about these people. And I felt comfortable and I felt safe. And it was something that really attracted me to all of you. And that was that I wasn't anybody's pet project. I was not your objective. I remember the old timers telling me, I don't know what you're going to do. But this is what we have done. They gave me the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and it says we. It didn't say you. This is what you got to do. This is what you need to do. This is what we have done. Do you, boo? I don't know what you're going to do. They used to say, if you ain't done, there's the door. You don't have to say, we ain't doing you no favors. Look, I tell the newcomer, I'm not getting no brownie, and then I got to give me a toaster if you join. You can do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. They told me to examine my relationship with alcohol, mine. And the way I examine it is listen to you. And I began listening to people in the meetings. And I would hear them share their story. And I was shocked. I didn't know that was alcoholism. We've been doing that for years. We've been doing that for generations. And you telling me that's alcoholism? Okay, call me very Latina. Call me dramatic. I'm very Telemundo. I don't care. But I think it was to my benefit. When I read the big book, it was like a pop-up book. They told me to read that book. It was a textbook. And I had to read line by line, word by word, and see if I can identify I don't know about you, but that book scared me. That was like a horror. That was like a horror movie. That was like a Stephen King movie. I was reading that big book and I was like, what? <laughs> Look, I've only had the privilege of sponsoring so far one Puerto Rican and her and I exactly alike. I love her. We both the same. I, you could you imagine sponsoring me? I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. What are you saying to me right now? <laughs> Hold on a second. Hold on. What's going on in here? <laughs> I'm scared. Are you scared? Look, <laughs> alcoholism is scary. You mean to tell me that I have an illness that will try to convince me that I don't have it? <laughs> Wait a second. I'm sorry. <laughs> Are you serious right now? <laughs> that means that I don't know I have it. <laughs> Hold up. Okay. I'm going to do everything possible to plan and plot and show that I don't have it. That's scary. That is centered in my thinking. They used to call it stinking thinking committee. They used to tell me, don't listen to it. So I used to go to meetings, if you knew, okay, I don't care. I used to go to meetings on the bus. And I used to talk to myself out loud like a schizophrenic, okay? And I used to say, you shut up. I'm not listening to you. They told me about you. They call you the disease. You leave me alone. I go to a meeting. I call in my sponsor. I'm not listening to you no more. You are dangerous. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. Look, I came here because this was the last house on the block. I can't live like that no more. I don't know how to do another 24 like that. I don't know how to walk, how to talk, how to breathe. I didn't even know that my name was Teresa. Maybe it was childlike, whatever. I have, look, either I'm going to do this Oh, I'm not. So I put down the drink and I picked up the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I got no in between, folks. I got no gray area. I have no other point of reference. So if I needed a drink to talk to you, I needed the steps to talk to you. If, if I needed a drink to have sex, I needed the steps to have sex. If I needed a drink to go to work, I needed the steps. That's literally how I had to do it. I don't know how to do anything else. 
You told me that I must find a power greater than myself. Not sort of, not maybe. They told me, hurry up. My higher power was alcohol. I needed another one. I hear a lot of people tripping. Oh, I got an issue with the higher power. I have a problem with the higher power. I don't like the higher power. Like you're talking about religion. But you know what it is to have a higher power. <laughs> what are you talking about? You cannot be an alcoholic and addict and not know what a higher power is. It's alcohol. If it determines when I get up in the morning and when I go to bed at night, where I'm going to live, where I'm not going to live, if I'm going to work, if I'm not, who I'm in a relationship and who I'm not, and if I'm in one, that's a higher power. You know what I mean? I'm like, <laughs> what am I stuck on that about? I needed another one. And I saw the other one that you got, you guys found. You found a higher power that I had never seen before. You see, the higher powers that I had before I came here were all things outside of myself. People, relationships, jobs, money, alcohol, drugs. Those were higher powers. And they failed me every time. They abandoned me. They left me. They abused me. And you know what those other higher powers did to me? They took my power away from me. They took my power of choice away. They, they did something with my will. I mean, they, they took my will without my permission. But the higher power you found here empowered you. I don't know, you guys. I digged it. This higher power empowered you. It gave you the freedom of choice. How do I know it gave you the freedom of choice? On step three, you can't make a decision unless you have a freedom of choice. I love the traditions. I'm a member because I say I am. I have a desire. I'm a member. People still joke in my home group and unit A. I walk around going, I'm a member. I have a desire. You have to help me. I don't like you either, okay? We don't have to like each other, but you have to help me because I'm a member, all right? And you're going to help me today. And, and I... <laughs> <coughs> I learned how to put principles before personalities. You may not be Puerto Rican, but that's none of my business. It's none of my business where you work, what's your political views, what music you listen to, what books you read. All I need to know is that you're an alcoholic. Still to this day, I can't talk to people about outside issues because I don't like you, okay? Unless you listen to salsa, I don't want to talk about the music you like, okay? I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't want to listen to it. I don't want to even talk about it. What step are you on? Let's talk about what, thank you. What your sponsors say, it's a safe conversation for me. <laughs> it just keeps me safe. Let's just talk. Whenever people will want to talk about her outfit, I used to tell people, don't talk to me about her outfit, okay? Talk to me about what step I can use to deal with her outfit, but do not talk to me about that woman's outfit. An old timer said there's only one person to a coffin. I don't know about you, but if I leave you guys, if I have to go right back to where I left off, it wasn't fun and it wasn't cute. I can't, I'm not going back there. Where I discovered that I truly understand that I'm an alcoholic, and if you knew, I don't go around saying, I'm never gonna drink again. I'm done with the drinking business. I'm not gonna drink. I swear I'm not gonna drink. I'm an alcoholic. I'm gonna drink. I'm gonna drink. If I don't treat my alcoholism, I'm drinking straight up. And so I put one hand in this program, one hand in God, and I had to go on a journey, a journey to a place I never thought I could, I needed to go to. Uh, that's where I had to find it. And it was inside of me. May not be a big deal to you, but it was to me. This woman, Marcy, said, you got a beautiful light inside of you. And we got a clean house for that light to shine. And I've been cleaning house. I've been willing to do whatever's necessary to uncover, discover, and get rid of anything that blocks me from my usefulness, my sponsor would say, from my authentic self. And I watched something happen to Teresa. I know about setting boundaries and having a voice and all this stuff. Look, I keep cleaning house. I work these 12 steps, and then I watch something happen. I have an intuitive thought. I have a brain to use. The miracles, I don't think about drinking. I watch myself become a daughter, a sister, a friend, a neighbor. I talk about my nephews a lot. I got two nephews and they love their titi. And I love that. They do. I know when I see my uncles, I used to be worried when I saw them and I would panic. 
So they, I'm grateful that when my nephews see me, they get excited and all their friends come out to see me. I think it's really cool. When I pick them out at, at a party or something, I go, can you come get me from this party? And I pick them up and all his friends come out. Are you guys? Ah, ah, it's all cool. They got a cool titi. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they be like, he be dropping nuggets. My nephews quote me like Confucius. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> And I said, God, take all of me. What will you have me be? What will you have me do? I've been the caretaker of most of my perpetrators and my abusers. As I said, my mother has Alzheimer's. I was telling them at the other meeting, they just gave her a different diagnosis. I'm like, that's alcoholism. She remembers what she wants to remember. She never knows what day it is. I've been living like that my whole life. <laughs> she, don't, she don't know what's going on. She's always been irresponsible. But anyway, <laughs> oh, you call that Alzheimer's now? All right. The only difference is the Al-Anon in me. Can't do anything too much about it. Because <laughs> she has Alzheimer's. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> she's just cracking up. She thinks that's funny. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know how not to give this program away. I throw myself harder into working with others. I've had a hard 31 years, you guys. My 31 years have not been easy. I remember going to meetings going, if you tell me this too shall pass, one more time I'm punching punch in the face. You understand me? Okay. Let me know what I do in the meantime. And you told me to help others. I've been through a lot of tragedies and a lot of losses and a lot of pain. All the things I didn't deal with when I was out there, I've dealt with them in here. I got new adjectives now. I got PTSD, anxiety, fibromyalgia, and now I have menopause. I'm like, you need to give me a minute. I am present for the experience. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Having hot flashes. <laughs> One minute I'm all sleep, next minute I turn into the exorcist. <laughs> Around the house, I be having... <laughs> The air on. I always make an announcement. I start singing that song. This girl is on fire. <laughs> Everybody starts putting on their coats and scarves. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> look, I love this program mainly because it has given me tools designed for living. I don't know if I can go back to that life. First of all, I'm getting too old. Okay. I don't have that kind of hustle. I don't have that kind of jive. I'm getting, I'd be telling that to my mother. My mother, they used to call her crazy cookie or whatever. I don't know. Well, real quick. One day my nephew was talking to her and he was like, Abuela, can you tell me stories when you were growing up? And she was like, oh, we used to kill people. I was like, okay, story time over. <laughs> my, no, my nephew was like, what? I was like, she tripping. She got Alzheimer's. But... <laughs> <laughs> that was a way of life that I don't think I can go back to. I can't go back to that insanity knowing that this one exists. And so I do everything to preserve my recovery. This is the most important thing that has been given to me. This is a gift. It's like a glass menagerie. And I do everything possible not to break it, not to lose it. That is my responsibility. Again, I heard Ralph said, thank you. I heard Ralph said, sobriety is a gift given to me by God, and what I do, it is my gift to God. Just like I didn't let nothing and nobody stand in the way of my drinking, I don't let nothing and nobody stand in the way of my recovery. I'm not having it. Because I don't know what will happen to you if you go back out. I know what's going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. I got another drink in me. But every part of me tells me that if I leave you, I swear, I get emotional about that. I will not have another recovery. I just believe that. I will not get a chance to come back here. We need those relapses. I appreciate any retreads. And our home group, we call you our scouts. You go out there and you come back and you let us know that it ain't working no more. But I don't think I'm going to be a scout. I won't be back here. And I'm just going to live out this alcoholic, torturous life, and I'm never going to make it back here. That terrifies me more than anything. So I do the uncomfortable until it becomes comfortable. I learn you're sick as your secrets, and I tell on myself, you ain't got to dance with everybody, but you need to dance with somebody. Somebody knows what's going on with Teresa. Again, I don't know how not to give this program away. I work with a lot of people. My phone rings like central office. It's not virtual. It's not impressive. I'm sicker than most. I need you more than ever. I tell newcomers, call me. You might catch me just in time before I slip my wrist. Bill said, if I don't talk to another drunk, I'm going to get drunk. I have a lot going on in my life today. I've been locked down with mommy since the pandemic. I have immune deficiency. She got all kinds of stuff. When I go outside, I got to dress up like CSI. Okay? 
And I love it how most people are like, I don't know what I would do if I was drinking during a pandemic. I do. I wouldn't even know there was a pandemic. I don't even know why you're talking about that. <laughs> that called, this is what's called sanity has returned. But if I was drinking, I wouldn't even know there was a pandemic. So the most part, I would say, why are you wearing a mask? And I wouldn't even trip. I would keep walking. <laughs> I already had my own pandemic before I got here. <laughs> the reason why I know this program works is that the moment the pandemic happened and people wanted to come by, I was like, you can't come by because I could die. <laughs> I was like, this program works. I'm worried about dying. <laughs> When I came to you, I was inviting death, and now I'm terrified of dying. <laughs> That's not something within itself. <laughs> so I always like ending with this. And it's just a reminder for me. I call God a show off. It takes a girl like me, unloved, unwanted, unnecessary, insignificant, picks me up, dusts me off, builds me up so you can see what it can do. I can't take any credit for it. I can't even pat myself on the back. All I needed to do was to apply the mustard seed of willingness. Just a mustard seed. And I was like, this power can do this for me. Could you imagine what he can do for you? My life is good today because I have tools to get through the day. It ain't what I have because I go through some stuff. Let me tell you, I got sponsees who stay sober just to see me get through the day. They used to show up at my house with a sandwich and an apple. <laughs> they like, we want to see how you're going to do this one. <laughs> You know, it's scary when I call my sponsor, my grand sponsor, and they be like, damn, <laughs> I don't know. I got to pray on that one. <laughs> I've been going to so much stuff. <laughs> they be like, ah, oh. they be like, <laughs> I don't know if I should feel bad or not, but they be like, damn, for real? <laughs> it's laughing. Everybody's laughing because I've been going through it. But the miracle is despite every circumstance, every situation, every tragedy, every pain, every hurt, I have not had a thought to drink. That's the miracle. Is that not a thought has occurred to me to drink? That's the miracle of it. I don't want to give that up for anything. If nobody told you they love you today, I truly, truly do. You definitely have done a 12-step call on me. You helped me get out of me. I'm going to keep coming back. Cleaning house, trusting in God, and being of service to others. And do the best I can to uncover, discover, and discard. And I always like to tell the newcomer, don't hold me to everything I told you because it's always changing. Check back with me next week. I'll be like, you know what I told you last week? That was deep, right? It sounded good. It no longer applies. <laughs> I know it sounded good last week. <laughs> I know, but it was deep, right? <laughs> I discovered I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> anyway. <laughs>